Hello, my name is Don Solik, and I am a partner at the Bonson Group and your host for this episode of The Financiers. The purpose of The Financiers is to provide core insights across the diversity of services we provide our clients. In this episode of The Financiers, we focus on business succession planning enhanced by philanthropy. Business succession planning is crucial in helping business owners steward their multi-generational wealth. Today we have Greg Ring, co-founder of The Giving Crowd. Greg, welcome to our episode. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Thanks, Don. Great to be with you. Thank you for the Bonson Group for hosting this. I hope this is helpful to you, uh, to your clients and uh, maybe some, to some uh, charities in the area. Um, July 1, I started my 40th year of uh, working with uh, nonprofits and with uh, generous people around the country. Uh, our firm uh, serves charities. They are our clients. We work with the charities uh, to help donors who have um, really opportunities to give assets that would make their philanthropy more efficient and typically open up a whole new um, category of giving that people don't typically think about. Uh, last year, Americans gave a little over $400 billion to charity, but the vast majority of that was people writing checks. And when, as you know, Don, when they... When people give out of their checkbook, they're giving after-tax dollars. And so our work is typically with closely held stock or real estate or uh, raw land, even cattle. Um, Some things are exotic. So um, we are really bringing ideas and concepts to the donor, and it's important. Um, We're going to look at some examples today that... um, uh, every situation is different. So people shouldn't, don't try this at home. You know, you want to work with your advisors and your attorney, your uh, legal and tax counsel on implementation. We're just looking at some overview, quick uh, look at some uh, situations that uh, just, I guess, encourage people to think more creatively about their planning, including their business succession planning. With business uh, succession planning, there is a study by the Business Enterprise Institute, and they found that of business owners plan to exit within 10 years. They also found that those same business owners thought that a plan was really important in order to be successful. And they also found that most business owners didn't have a plan. So we come alongside business owners as part of our overall strategy planning, and we uh, we have a seven-step process that helps identify goals, uh, helps the business owner maximize their their business, uh, looking at different exit or transfer strategies, uh, making sure there's business continuity, uh, incorporating their philanthropic and their family governance into those into those plans. And so, um, I thought it was really important that we, um, you know, get together and, and talk about some of those things. Um, we there are all kinds of different business exit and transfer plans, from liquidating to IPOs to uh, transferring. So today we're going to focus on three of those areas. The, the first is uh, transferring um, assets uh, to a third party. The second is uh, transferring assets to uh, children. And, and the third is to employees. So uh, if you want to take us through those um, diff- three different case studies. Then sure. Sure. Happy to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Uh, So this first example, all of these are real-life people. The first two have been completed. The third one is still in motion. Uh, This uh, first one where we're selling to a third party would be the most common. Uh, uh, VIP Forum has estimated that 82% of closely held businesses will be sold prior to retirement rather than pass them to the next generation. So this is the most common scenario. Here we have a real-life couple. Uh, they're in their 80s. Uh, they own 37.5% of a company uh, that's worth about $80 million. Their EBITDA is running about $23 million this year. They anticipate a sale. We thought it was going to be in the third quarter, but it's probably going to be the fourth quarter. And uh, so what we did over a period of time is, first of all, understand what their goals are. Um, it's very helpful for people to, if they can understand the big picture of things like how much do we want our children to receive, that helps them then in doing planning on the business succession or on the philanthropy piece, because if I can identify inheritance and generational wealth issues, that helps me then determine uh, between do I want to give the excess to the government or have it taxable versus uh, giving it to charity. 
So if we follow the numbers here, number one would be they 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 take um, a percentage of the stock in their company. And again, I don't want to get us down in the details, but it is important for people to know they should talk with their legal or tax people because S corp stock, for example, is treated differently than C corp stock. So just a word of caution for folks. In this case, we have an LLC interest. So they're passing uh, 40% of that interest in the company worth about $12 million down into the charitable remainder trust. The charitable remainder trust is a tool that's been around since the 1969 tax act. Most people have heard of it at some level. Um, it is tax exempt because when the husband and wife in this example have both passed away, the remainder interest is going to go to charity. And so Congress uh, in 1969 said, if you'll make an irrevocable commitment of resources going to charity when you die, then we're going to allow you to have three benefits. You put the stock in, it is sold to the buyer. And now benefit number one is I pay no long-term capital gain tax on the sale of this highly appreciated asset. Benefit number two is um, I, I have income coming out of here for the rest of my life. In this example, they have $50,000 a month of retirement income uh, for this couple coming back to them for the rest of their life. And benefit number three is a charitable income tax deduction. Uh, item number two here is they took 10%. In this particular couple's case, they thought of it as a tithe uh, going directly to charity. Uh, they used a donor-advised fund to do this, but it could have gone directly to their favorite one or two or three charities. Uh, but, but in this case, we used a tax-exempt uh, entity called a donor-advised fund. These have been around for about 25 years. Fidelity is the largest out there, but there's a bunch of others, 1,400 of them total around the country. Uh, it allows them to put an appreciated asset in, and in this case, they don't have income coming back. It's simply my wife and I call ours our charitable checking account. We can put stock or cash in, sell it tax-free, and now that all of our giving comes out of that donor-advised fund to the different charities that we give to. And then number three is an outright sale. So 40% went to the charitable remainder trust, 10% as an outright gift to charity through a donor-advised fund, and then the balance, the remaining 50%, sold outright. This was to give him, he's 82, but he still wants to do some investing and might start another company, and, and so this gave him some cash, free and clear, after tax, uh, to, um, to, to just have available. Uh, if you look at the chart here then, number four is we have a buyer who now, instead of writing one check to the seller, is writing three checks. One check to the charitable remainder trust when he's buying the company, a second check to the donor advised fund, and a third check back to Mr. and Mrs. Smith here, we call them. And so the buyer ends up with the whole company, but he has... Um, written three checks in the process. And what we've done here from a tax perspective is their long-term capital gain tax exposure went down by nearly 70%. So big drop uh, if you're selling uh, $30 million worth of uh, highly appreciated stock. And finally, number five is um, charity will receive a portion, that tithe portion, immediately during their lifetime. This is something they can watch benefit their favorite charity during their lifetime. And then the remainder is coming from the charitable remainder trust. And that's when they both passed away. Husband and wife have passed away. So the final thing I'd say on this, just to encourage people to get uh, confused on this often, this kind of planning has to be done before they're in a contract to sell. It's critically important. So work with your legal or tax advisor, call Don, uh, whatever's appropriate, but it's just they can't wait until after they've signed a contract or a, a binding letter of intent and then try to do this kind of planning. It has to be done in advance. I was with a gentleman yesterday who doesn't have a buyer lined up. He thinks he'll sell in the next couple of years. And so I said, well, let's create the plan, and then you can put it on the shelf. And so it's ready when you do have the buyer come along with a price that you want to accept. And so that's what I would encourage folks. Yeah. That's great. We use this strategy and we've also had some um, owners that came to us after the sale and tried to uh, use the strategy and they were unable to do that and there was a lot of tax implications and unhappiness and all, and all of those things. So uh, thank you. The next uh, 
the next uh, strategy that you have? Well, this is um, a sale to children. Uh, real life couple here again. Uh, they have four uh, small companies, nice healthy companies. This particular one's worth about $10 million. And um, their two sons have been growing in responsibility of running this business for the last five years or so. Mom and dad have been watching them and kind of seeing how they do. One son is doing operations, the other son is doing marketing. And uh, dad feels like they're ready now to have ownership. He's ready to begin moving equity in the company and not just pay him a paycheck and, and bonuses. However, he doesn't want to give them the stock. He doesn't want them to feel entitled like they get stock just because they're the kids. He also doesn't want to sell them the stock and pay long-term capital gain tax. So what we did is in December of last year, number one, you can see we transferred 40%, $4 million worth of the stock down into a donor advised fund again. And let me just touch on this. The donor advised fund, I, I think, is one of the most important tools in philanthropy today. We don't have one. Our firm doesn't have one. So we there's lots of great ones out there. Uh, but there's three benefits that I talk about. The first is um, it's, it's simple. My wife and I give to 14 different charities every month. And it used to be that I had to wait for us to get our receipts from our charitable giving and to, to do my taxes. And, you know, sometimes it'd be March before I would get a receipt from some charity. Now we get one receipt usually by the first week of February, and has an itemization of all the giving that we did the previous year in one, one document that I can now attach to my tax return. The second uh, benefit, I think, is we get invited to uh, golf events or banquets, as I know you do, and sometimes it's from a charity that we don't know, but our friends invite us, so we go, and, and I don't want to be a cheapskate and go and have a dinner and leave. So I'll call my donor advised fund. I'll say, hey, cut a check to this charity for this amount of money, but I want to be anonymous. That way we can go to the event and we can make a gift. We can be as generous as we want, but we don't get on their mailing list. And so for your audience, the, the kind of folks that you work with, they get invited to these sort of things all the time. They might find a donor advised fund to be helpful uh, to them. The third benefit is in our estate plan, we have uh, three daughters, and a fourth of our estate is going to each of our three girls, and then one-fourth to charity. Well, the fourth going to charity is going through our donor-advised fund, and uh, that allows us to, to have it distributed out of the donor-advised fund after we die. But if I change my mind on a charity, I don't have to have a codicil done to my will. I can simply call the donor-advised fund up and tell them to take this charity out and put this one in. So it's a, it's a great tool. As I said, there's a lot of them out there that your folks can, uh, and you might be able to help them uh, look at some of the donor advised funds that are available. Yeah, we use Fidelity and, uh, and the National Christian Foundation are t uh, two of a few that we use. Great. Yeah. I, those, and those are two of the top. Those are two of the best out there. So back to our example here. In December of last year, we transferred 40% of this $10 million company. And in our example, I'm not taking into account minority discounts. I'm trying to keep this very high level and very simple. 40% went into the donor advised fund in December. Then in February, the boys, the two sons, bought that stock out of the donor advised fund on a 10-year on a, a note. So what's happened there is they now uh, have a new cost basis because they bought the stock. They have a higher cost basis than mom and dad's zero cost basis. Number two, they have what dad wanted, and that was an emotional tie to the company. I'm an owner, not just an employee. Uh, they're buying it on favorable terms from the donor advised fund. So they're paying this off over 10 years. And if they continue to grow the company, by the time they have that stock the note, excuse me, paid off, uh, the stock's going to be worth much more, maybe double or triple what it is today. So they have a great inheritance package given to them, but they bought it. They purchased it. From mom and dad's perspective, uh, benefit number three you can see up here is they pay no long-term capital gain taxes. So they didn't give the stock to the children, 
and they also didn't pay any of taxes. Instead, in fact, they, they're getting a $4 million charitable income tax deduction. And at the end of the day, they're going to have $4 million to give to their favorite charities. And this couple is extremely generous. They're wild. They've been given 50% of their adjusted gross income for decades. So that would be an example of, of how you might consider moving an asset, a business, closely held stock, income producing property. Uh, we're talking with a fellow right now about a cattle ranch and using this strategy to move that cattle ranch down to his children without paying taxes and, and uh, with the children getting some benefits too. That's great. How about employees? Okay, employees. Selling to employees is most commonly done through an ESOP. And ESOPs are appropriate in some situations and not in others. This is the one I mentioned is not completed yet. This proposal is on the table with this gentleman. But uh, one of the things he said to me, I, um, I said, what will happen, uh, are you critical to running the company? What will happen if you sell it to a third party? He said, no, our employees, he said, I do very little at the company. And so I said, well, have you looked at, at selling it to an ESOP? And so uh, we talked about that for some time. The only wrinkle that we've done here on a traditional uh, in, employee stock ownership plan is the charitable component. Uh, in addition to the normal, if you follow the, the numbers here, a loan is taken out through a bank for $24 million. That loan goes down to the ESOP. The ESOP uses that uh, to buy the stock from the owner. And that's, a uh, depending on if it's an S-Corp or a C-Corp, a tax-free transaction for the donor, for the client, rather. But what we did here for this couple is we also showed them 20% of their stock going uh, to charity. So they also made then a charitable gift of some of the closely held stock to charity, and then the ESOP is buying that stock from uh, the donor advised fund or from the charity. So it's similar to that first example in that we have charity benefiting with closely held stock that's liquidated and now the charity has cash and the donor paying no taxes on that process and also getting a charitable income tax deduction. Otherwise, it's, it's similar. But the ESOP does have some very, very specific rules that you have to watch out for. Uh, but, but this strategy might help accent or enhance somebody who's already looking at an ESOP but hasn't looked at a, a charitable ESOP process. Well, thank you very much for sharing those strategies. They're, they're certainly beneficial to charities, to business owners. It helps in a bunch of different ways from philanthropy to exit strategies to, to helping children too to learn about the business or inherit values. You also do charitable planning outside of business succession planning with um, different strategies, and, and uh, that'll be a topic that we'll have you back for. Jeez, but thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you um, spending time with us. And thank you, Don. I really appreciate it. And kudos to the Bonson Group. So often I have people say to me, my attorney, my financial advisor, no one brought up any charitable strategies. So uh, good for you, and, and kudos to the Bonson Group for uh, putting this out there. I hope you find it helpful to your clients. Thank you very much. Thank you.